Psychedelic Sundays. Psychedelic Sundays. Psychedelic Sundays. Psychedelics are re-emerging into public awareness in a big way. Scientific studies that were once taboo or illegal are now being performed and shared around the world. These studies show that most psychedelics are not only safe and non-habit forming, but also have incredible healing potential when used in the proper context. Hey, what's up everyone? This is Satori D, and I have a special Psychedelic Sunday show for you. Um, the other day, I went to the Psychedelic, uh, it was called Psychedelic Career Day, and it was this webinar, and it was really interesting, and we had a good talk about the career path of, of studying psychedelics in therapy, and medicine, and all sorts of different things, um, so please enjoy this first part. Uh, so today is an interesting and exciting day. Uh, we have people coming in from all over the world, from Mumbai to Scotland to California, uh, sitting in with us online and also here in person in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, I myself am at the University of Toronto, uh, the St. George campus downtown, and uh, we're hosting this on campus. So to begin for today, uh, we're going to have an address by Dr. Ben Sessa. Uh, Dr. Sessa is a curator and founder of Breaking Convention, which is a biennial conference in the UK. Uh, ben is also a consultant, child and addiction psychiatrist with 20 years of clinical experience in child abuse. He studied LSD, psilocybin, ketamine, DMT, and especially MDMA, uh, and is now running the first MDMA study for alcoholism. He's also published a number of books and novels about psychedelics, and uh, is a very prominent voice in the advocacy for this new domain of psychotherapeutic investigation. All right, so without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Sessa to the screen. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you to all the organizers for making this happen. As far as I can tell, this is the world's first international webinar on this topic, um, which is obviously great. I think it's also a really, really important thing to happen because um, I get called all the time, as I'm sure all the, all the researchers in this field do. I get emails all the time from young people who really can see this psychedelic renaissance taking shape. Um, people who come from all different fields, um, not just medicine and psychology, um, but everywhere, nursing, social work, um, and non-healthcare professions everywhere from architecture and music and art and literature um, to politics and law, uh, chemistry, botany, ethnobotany, um, you name it, there really isn't a profession that isn't in some way touched by psychedelics. So um, it really is a field which is wide open now. And um, for all the young people who are interested, now is the time to get involved because um, there is a role for you, whatever your professional interest is. And so hopefully uh, that's going to come across with uh, this um, webinar today. So I've got slides and you should be able to see them now. Yes, yeah, we can see them fine. You can see the slides. Cool. OK, well, let's get going then. So um, what I'm going to talk about then is um, a little bit about my career tra trajectory, as this is highly relevant to this talk. Essentially, my career um, is in medicine and in child and adolescent psychiatry. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my work in, with children in terms of child abuse and how the developing child's brain is affected by trauma and stressful environments. I'm going to talk a bit about how traditional treatments for managing trauma within psychiatry are fairly poor and where I have found myself moving towards this compound MDMA as, in my opinion, the newest, most innovative and best bet we have in modern psychiatry today for tackling this issue of trauma due to child abuse. Um, I'm going to talk about problems with alcohol, um, and that leads on to the study that we're doing in Bristol at the moment with alcohol use disorder using MDMA therapy. And then I'm going to finish up with a little bit about the latest um, research that's going on around the world and how this relates to people who are interested in a career in this field. So I just want people to have a read of that, first of all. I'll read it out. 
There's a stronger link between childhood trauma and addiction than there is between obesity and diabetes. Two thirds of addicts report being abused as children. That means that the war on drugs is a war on traumatized people that just need help. That's a fairly shocking thing. And when we look at that picture of that scared, humiliated, frightened, bruised, little 10, 11 year old girl, we are full of pity and we're full of sentimentality. And we see this little girl as this poor, helpless little victim. Now, what happens though, when this little girl grows up? Well, by the time she's 11 or 12, she's using other drugs. She's smoking cannabis and she's using alcohol. By the time she's in her mid-teens, she's using amphetamine. And by the time she's in her 20s, she's addicted to heroin and she's addicted to alcohol. And suddenly, we don't want to know. Suddenly, we've lost our sentimentality and our empathy and we judge her and she is scum. She is public enemy number one. And she's sitting there on the sidewalk now and she wants you to give her a pound. Don't give her any money. She'll only spend it on booze. It's her fault. She could stop if she wanted to, but she doesn't want to stop using drugs. It's a lifestyle choice. She did this to herself. Now that's outrageous. It's, it's deeply unethical. It's vile. It's sad, it's all of those things, but it's also scientifically incorrect. And what I think we really need to do when we talk about child abuse and trauma and that developmental trajectory from those early traumatic experiences into adult mental disorders and addictions, we need to understand the science behind that. Because when we judge this little girl who's now become a difficult antisocial adult, when we judge her harshly, we're not only being morally and ethically awful, but we are also not appreciating the science behind this trajectory. And so that's a very important part of what I want to get across. So in terms of my own career trajectory, in some ways I've followed that same trajectory as my patients. Starting out in doing medicine and surgery and then specializing in um, mental health and then adolescent mental health and working with these children with child abuse and maltreatment and watching how that progressed into adolescent mental health problems and this development of what we call complex post-traumatic stress disorder and then seeing that same cohort of people grow up into adults and develop substance misuse problems and then working with that population within adult psychiatry what became apparent to me was that the treatments that we have are poor they're ineffective and they don't work and they also cause a lot of harm in a lot of cases. Now, I use these treatments. I would be a hypocrite to say I didn't because they're all we have. But what my work has done for me has shown me that there is an alternative. And it's the interest in psychedelic therapies and particularly MDMA that's brought me to where I am now in my own career. So when we look at abuse, we know about the big types of what we call child abuse. And these would be things like sexual and physical abuse. And this is the stuff that gets onto the social services radar. But what I would always say is don't take your eye off the other types of abuse, particularly emotional abuse and neglect. Um, with child psychiatry, you always hear child psychiatrists banging on about attachment theory. Attachment is so crucial to the development of healthy psychological functioning. Those emotional experiences you have as a child become the blueprint for how we judge ourselves and the world around us. Um, the fundamental aspects of what is love, what is care, what is protection, what is trust, what are parents for? These things that we may take for granted, those of us with secure attachments, if you've grown up in an environment with an insecure attachment, surrounded by fear and stress, these fundamental parts of the self become very distorted. And it's not just those psychological issues, but there's also a lot of what we call unstable psychosocial environments, domestic abuse between parents, parental substance addiction and abuse, and social factors like unemployment, poor housing, exclusion through racism, and of course, poor education. In some ways, I sometimes wonder whether my time would be better spent working as a social worker than a doctor. In fact, if I hadn't done a career in medicine, social work was definitely my, my second choice. If we could have excellent support for young single mothers and excellent social 
um, factors and economic factors, we'd probably halve all of our mental health problems overnight. So th these are crucial factors to get right. And anybody who works in mental health services knows that they work with the people who are on the bottom rung of the ladder. It's not just their mental health problems they're dealing with, but it's all of the social factors as well. Now, what does this do to a child's brain? So a little bit of a physiology lesson here. Um, we've got two areas of the brain here. The red area is the amygdala and the green area is the prefrontal cortex. Now, when you are, um, the amygdala is a very primitive part of the brain that fires in, resp in response to stress. If you're growing up in a stressful environment, your amygdala will become hypersensitive. Now, when the amygdala is stimulated by fear in the environment, it sends out a very instinctive, immediate command, which triggers a hormonal response, which you've probably heard of, called the fight or flight response. Now, this response um, is a survival technique, and it's absolutely essential. Someone comes into the room now with a knife, your amygdala will fire and it'll say, you're in danger, get out, prepare to fight or flee. So it's a very important response. Now, the prefrontal cortex, the area in green, is much more sophisticated. Only um, humans really have a significant prefrontal cortex. And this is the part of the brain that's less instinctive. It's more what we might call human. This is where we have the faculties such as logic and reasoning and planning. And we can overcome that immediate amygdala response with a much more measured human prefrontal response. So we may look at this person who's got this knife and we may say, well, he looks okay. I reckon I could probably talk to him. Um, I could reason with him. So the prefrontal cortex is in a kind of constant relationship with the amygdala to manage the fearful response. Now, if you are exposed constantly to stress, if you never know from one minute to the next when the caregiver coming into your room is gonna, are they gonna give you a kiss and a cuddle and do a jigsaw with you? Or are they gonna punch you or kick you or rape you? Now, when you grow up in an environment like that, you have physical brain changes. The amygdala becomes hypersensitive and the prefrontal cortex shrinks. You don't, there's no evolutionary advantage in having a strong prefrontal cortex response. If you were seeing the good in people and logically reasoning the fear in which, in which you're subjected to, you'd die because nobody's looking after you as this young child. Nobody's feeding you, nobody's protecting you. So it's an evolutionary advantage to have an, a, an exaggerated amygdala response. So we have these physical brain changes that occur in the brains of children developing in stressful environments. And what this does is you build up a very negative set of narratives. And these are the stories with which you describe yourself. You have negative self-narratives. I am useless. I am worthless. I'm not going to amount to anything. I'm unlovable. I'm unloved. I'm a slut. I deserve to be exploited. It's my fault. And then you build up these negative narratives about the world. The world is dangerous. The world is unsafe. People are not to be trusted. If someone's being nice to you, they're just going to try and screw you over. So get the boot in first because you can't trust them. Now, this is a very, very disordered way of looking at the world and the self. And what people do as they grow up into adolescence and adults, they find that these narratives are so overwhelming and painful. The only option is to sedate themselves with substances such as alcohol, um, heroin, benzodiazepines, other substances that block out the feelings rather than dealing with them and approaching them. Now, childhood trauma has an enormous clinical burden. It has an enormous physical burden, a societal burn, burden, and a extremely expensive financial burden as well. Now, PTSD presents with some pretty important core features. High levels of anxiety and depression, what we call re-experiencing phenomena, flashbacks during the day and nightmares at night in which the frightening experiences are remembered and come flooding back in what we call dissociative episodes in which a person may get flashbacks of the event or they may just completely switch off from the everyday life um, and uh, they lose an integration between themselves and the environment around them. 
It's also characterized by what we call hypervigilance. And this is a sort of jumpiness, an edginess, in which um, you believe that the assailant is around the next corner and constantly living in a state of avoidance of anything that could trigger those painful memories. Also, high rates of self-harm and suicide, and as I said, high rates of substance misuse. Now, it's very difficult to treat PTSD. And the reason being is that we don't have a single um, pharmacological or psychotherapeutic option that allows the person to engage with their fear, with the trauma that um, underpins the disorder. So rather, we treat it symptomatically. If the patient has depression, give them an antidepressant. If they can't sleep, give them a hypnotic. If their mood goes up and down, give them a mood stabilizer. And if that hypervigilance, that edginess, gets worse and progresses towards psychosis and paranoia, give them an antipsychotic. So we use a large number of medications, none of which get to the heart of the problem, none of which treat the trauma itself, but they just mask the symptoms as they arise. Now, we also have a many different psychotherapies. We have DBT and APT and IPT and CBT. Now, all of these psychotherapies are different um, and have different models, but essentially all psychotherapies, is, in my opinion, boils down to this, can we talk about your pain? Can you tell us about your rape? Now, these pa patients with PTSD have spent their entire lives doing anything but think about that night when they were eight years old and their grandfather came into their bedroom. Their entire life thereafter has been to block out that memory. They will drink, they will use drugs like heroin in order to not go there. So when their psychotherapist then sits down and says, let's talk about your rape, they're out the door. They disengage from treatment and they return to their substances. Now this results in a 50% treatment resistance in treating trauma. Half the patients with PTSD become chronic lifelong cases. Now, this is not good enough. After a hundred years of modern psychiatry, we should be doing better. So where are we going wrong here? Well, I would propose that we are in psychiatry today where we were in general medicine a hundred years ago. At the end of the 19th century, turn of the 20th century, medicine was losing the battle to the infectious diseases. We were very good at diagnosing and classifying them. And we wrote these big statistical manuals back in the end of the 19th century about who got smallpox, who got tuberculosis, how many people died postoperatively from infections. But we didn't have the treatment, the antibiotic, that actually killed the bug. And then we started to learn about the microorganisms and we developed um, vaccines and antibiotics. And we finally began to go on, get on top of the infectious diseases. Now, I would propose we're in the same place with psychiatry today. We're very good at writing these statistical manuals and making diagnoses as to who gets depression, who gets anxiety, who gets PTSD, how many people get substance use disorders. But we're very poor at treating them because we paper over the cracks with these symptomatic treatments. A good example would be, say, taking paracetamol or ibuprofen when you have a, a, a high temperature. If you have an infection, which is due to a microorganism, it's gonna give you a fever, a high temperature. And yeah, you can take paracetamol and ibuprofen, why not? Brings your temperature down a bit, makes you feel a bit better. But paracetamol and ibuprofen are not antibiotic. They're not gonna kill the bug. They're just gonna paper over the cracks. And when we give patients all of these SSRIs and mood stabilizers and hypnotics and antipsychotics, that's what we're doing. We're giving them a paracetamol for their infection without giving them an antibiotic. And you can see where this is going. So where's our antibiotic? Well, I'm proposing that this drug, 3,4-methylindioxymethamphetamine is the best thing we've got so far. Indeed, if you were going to invent a drug to treat trauma, it would be MDMA. And this really is because of its very unique set of uh, receptor profiles and how these affect it psychologically. It's a very useful drug to use clinically, short acting, two to five hours. It has some mild perceptually disturbing effects like the classical psychedelics, but we're not talking dripping balls and stuff like that with, that you might get with LSD and psilocybin. It's also almost always pleasurable. Now, that's a very important characteristic in pharmacology. Um, other drugs like that, that would be the opiate drugs, um, 
Now, classical psychedelics could go either way, and obviously they're very useful tools, uh, LSD and psilocybin, but um, they're, they're not always tolerated by all patients, whereas MDMA is kind of universally tolerated, um, whether it, it, it may work in some and not in others, but it's usually a tolerated, pleasurable experience, and that's important when considering it as a clinical tool. It's also extremely safe, um, and it's ability to access these painful traumatic memories and enhance empathy is what makes it important. And I'm just gonna go through some of the receptor profiles in just a moment with MDMA. First of all, let's see where MDMA sits in terms of psychedelic classifications. Well, it's a, it's a drug that's based on the phenethylamine molecule. Um, a lot of psychedelic drugs can be put into these broad categories of the tryptamines and the phenethylamines. Well, there's MDMA as a phenethylamine. Um, there's other ways of classifying psychedelic drugs as well. I, I mentioned the classical psychedelics, LSD, psilocybin, DMT, and mescaline. MDMA sits into this group below called the intactogens, um, of which MDMA is the most well-known, but all of the drugs in the 2C series and other, other formulations around MDMA, like MDA and MMDA, um, also have this intactogenic effect, which I'm going to explain a little bit in a, in a moment. And then we've got other drugs such as the dissociative anesthetics, which are a very fascinating, and useful group of drugs, ketamine being well known and uh, nitrous oxide being well known. Um, PCP is not so well known in the UK, but I gather it's more prevalent in the States. Then we have drugs like tetrahydrocannabinol, which is certainly considered psychedelic, ibogaine, salvia, and many, many, many more sorts of psychedelic drugs. So, um, here is the uh, table that I was mentioning in terms of MDMA's receptor profile. Um, a lot of people think of MDMA as, oh, it enhances, M it enhances serotonin. Well, it, it's much more sophisticated than that. It increases the serotonin at the 5-HT1A and 1B receptor effects. Now, these are the effects where you have this positive mood, this reduction in depression and anxiety, the sense of euphoria. Um, I guess the ecstasy part of the molecule, um, it reduces fear. It reduces fear at the amygdala and it allows the patient therefore to engage with painful memory recall where normally, like I said, they would do everything in their power to avoid those memories. With MDMA, they can actually um, spend time thinking about those memories without being overwhelmed. So this is important. It has also an effect here at the two A receptors which um, where the classical psychedelics, LSD, psilocybin, et cetera, work, um, though as mentioned, far less intense than the classical psychedelics, but enough of an effect to provide this alteration in, in thinking, this kind of um, thinking outside the box and increased creativity, which is really important when helping a patient be stuck. Also has effects here, the uh, dopamine and noradrenaline receptors where it has a stimulating effect. And this is the amphetamine part of the molecule. This is very important because it raises the patient's level of arousal and alertness, which improves their engagement to take part in therapy. So it, it engages them and sets them up to talk. But at the same time, um, it has this paradoxical relaxation effect at the alpha one and two receptors. Now, this is very important and a very unusual, um, unique effect of MDMA. And I think anybody in the audience who may have tried MDMA in any form would, would recognize this, this peculiar effect of being both speeded up and slowed down at the same time. And what this does is it puts the patient into what we call this optimal arousal zone. Now, that relaxation effect by the alpha receptors is very important because that takes the edge off the hypervigilance, which is one of the core features of the the trauma experience. So you have this perfect arousal zone in which to take part in therapy. And then it has an effect at the hypothalamus where it increases the release of a hormone called oxytocin. Now, it's feeding mothers. It's a hormone that engenders a sense of attachment and engenders a sense of bonding and empathy. And taken together in totality, all of these effects add up to this extremely unique characteristic of MDMA, which selectively removes the fear response associated with the recall of painful memories. So all the other faculties are intact. The patient can talk, they can think, they can remember, 
they can engage in psychotherapy, but the fear part has been taken away. So these painful memories that they've spent their whole lives doing anything but approach, on MDMA, they can go there and they can sit down with their therapist. And when the therapist says, tell me about your rape, they can say, yes, I can. I've spent 30 years doing anything but talk about this, but now I can. And they can sit in the therapy session for eight hours and talk about the pain, which really has this effect of moving them from that 50% who can't be treated into the 50% who can. So it allows you to do trauma-focused psychotherapy because it focuses directly on the trauma aspects. Or rather, the patient and therapist together can focus on those because the patient, for the first time in their life, is able to. Now, and what it does, let's return just to that brain with that exaggerated amygdala response and shrunken prefrontal response, what MDMA does is the complete opposite of that. It shrinks the amygdala response. Things that you would normally find frightening, you no longer find so frightening and you can deal with. And it boosts the prefrontal response. The patient's able to see things in a new light. They're able to see the good in things and the good in people. And this is the empathy part. They can empathize with the situation that their assailant was going through at the time when they were being assaulted. Now that's an extremely healing position to reach in psychotherapy. And I recall a patient whose video I saw in which she was saying, I find it hard to condone or forgive even what my father did to me, but for him to do that to a child, he must have been in a really, really bad way at the time. Now that's an amazing piece of empathy coming from a survivor of childhood abuse and maltreatment. And it's an extremely healing place to get to in psychotherapy. So um, a few words about uh, this dangerous legal high, alcohol. Um, I don't know what it's like in your countries, but in the UK, we have a worrying, dangerous relationship with alcohol. Um, it's endemic. It is impacting on all aspects of our society. It's far too available. It's far too cheap. A can of lager in the supermarket costs 49 pence. The equivalent amount of water costs 89 pence. Now, what is going on there? We have alcohol for sale in petrol stations. We have alcohol for sale in motorway service stations. It's on every street corner. You hear it talked about on breakfast TV. It's de rigueur for students to get as drunk as possible. And we're sitting on a clinical time bomb here. We're looking at high rates of liver disease, especially in young women, and these are rising. Um, and high rates of dependence upon alcohol. And then, as I've said, when you look at a population of people with addictions and other mental disorders, the rates of alcohol use are very high indeed. And this is because, as I said, patients are using this substance to block out their painful memories, to numb themselves. Now, despite the wealth of evidence around this, we do not seem to be adequately tackling this with um, government policies. Indeed, I would, I would liken the UK drinks industry as, uh, as very similar to the United States uh, National Rifle Association, where you have evidence stacking up about the importance of change, but for some reason, because this lobby group is so financially and politically powerful, we're not having change. So we're in this frustrating position where those of us in the field are feeling extremely impotent to affect change when um, the government seem to know what's going on but don't make changes. If you're diagnosed with alcohol use disorder and you have a detox, which is when you take a, a high dose benzodiazepine to come to bring you off the physical side of the physical withdrawal effects of the alcohol. And then you undergo treatment with the best that modern medicine can throw at you. Our outcomes are still extremely poor. Indeed, four years after a detox from alcohol use disorder, 90% of people will relapse. This is with the best treatment that medicine can offer. Again, this is not good enough and we should be doing better. So we have proposed that perhaps alcohol 
use disorder or alcohol dependence could be treated by MDMA therapy. Now, this has never been done before. The use of classical psychedelics um, have a very rich history in, in addictions. Indeed, most of the work that was done in the late 50s, um, the mid to late 50s with uh, LSD psychotherapy was done on, on alcohol use disorder. Um, a lot of teens in, in Canada led the way with that. Osman's teens there. And then in modern times, we've had drugs such as ketamine and we have drugs such as psilocybin that's been applied to addictions. Bogenschutz's work with, with psilocybin for alcohol, Matthew Johnson's work with psilocybin for nicotine addiction, and um, Kropitsky's work using ketamine um, to treat uh, both alcohol and cocaine addictions and opiate addiction. And we've had some interesting work also recently with ayahuasca treating um, a range of different uh, substance disorders. Now, one thing that stands out about all of these studies with classical psychedelics and addictions is the stronger the spiritual experience, the greater the patient has their mind blown and they glimpse God or some kind of mystical version of God, then the greater the rates of abstinence and the greater the sobriety. Now, we know that MDMA doesn't have such a classically psychospiritual effect. About maybe 10 to 15 percent of people on their first dose threshold, first threshold dose MDMA experience will report a numinous mystical spiritual experience, which is pretty high, but not as high as the 80 to 90 percent that will report spiritual experiences with classical psychedelics. So in a way, we're missing that part of the treatment with MDMA. But what we feel we have is this very strong effect in treating trauma by providing this sense of empathy. And indeed, most of the studies, um, all of the studies, in fact, apart from uh, Alicia Danforth's study with autism, all of the studies so far with MDMA have been on PTSD, so focusing on trauma. So in, in, in developing our study in Bristol, we were keen to broaden um, MDMA therapy to use other diagnoses. And because we know that alcohol use disorder is associated very strongly with trauma as a child, we're putting two and two together here and assuming that we might, we're hypothesizing that MDMA that psychotherapy might work with alcohol dependence. And I would welcome your um, thoughts on that as well. So we have a open label study. Now, this is open label. This means that it is not a randomized control study. There is no control group. Everybody gets MDMA. We know they get MDMA. And they know they get MDMA. So we will not, with this study, be able to separate the benefits of the medicine from the benefits of the psychotherapy. Now, that's fine because this is a first, world's first proof of concept study. Our main outcomes are safety and tolerability more than um, their alcohol drinking behavior. We have an eight week course which involves 10 sessions, two of which are MDMA assisted, and they take a, a dose of 187.5 milligrams in each of those sessions, and then they stay overnight. Now, the outcome measures, as I mentioned, are primarily those around safety and tolerability. We are, of course, interested in whether they drink less um, over time, but they're not the primary outcome measures. Um, and there is a picture of the study team, um, myself and that's Laurie with the dark hair on the end. We're the co-therapists. Tim Williams is the um, one of the local doctors working with the local addiction service. And um, Claire Durant there is uh, our research associate. And David Nutt in the middle is the um, supervisor for the study, which is taking place, um, sponsored by Imperial College London um, and taking place in Bristol clinically. So there's a little breakdown of the course. The patient comes in for their detox. So they have a detox with benzodiazepines and then they come out of the detox, what we call dry. In other words, they are now cured, if you like, of the physical effects of the alcohol. They are not gonna be suffering the shakes and the sweats. Um, and crucially, they're not gonna be at risk of further seizures, but they're still absolutely at risk of uh, relapse, and that's where they normally go into the, the other NHS treatments that medicine uses. Um, but instead, they come into our 10 week course, which, uh, as you can see, involves weekly sessions with therapy and MDMA assisted sessions on weeks three and six, which are sessions three and seven. And 
this is a pretty standard setup for all psychedelic therapies. Um, it's always a combination of preparation sessions, drug sessions, sandwiched between integration sessions. And then we follow up the patients at three, six, and nine months where we conduct all the various interviews and rating scales. Now, MDMA is extremely safe. When I used to talk about MDMA, and I've been doing this about 15 years, I used to spend hours on all of these graphs and tables demonstrating the safety of ecstasy. I don't, want you, I don't want to talk about ecstasy. I like to do these talks and not use the E word once because clinical MDMA has nothing to do with recreational ecstasy, whatever that is. And the, the risks that we might see with recreational ecstasy um, can be reduced to an absolute minimum when it's used in the clinical setting. And um, we have a whole host of different safety measures that we're using in terms of uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria. We monitor the patient's physiological state throughout the sessions. We, we monitor them daily for seven days after each session. And then we follow them up after many months as well. So um, a great many safety measures in place for this study. Now, even I will now contradict myself and say I'm not going to talk about ecstasy. Let's look at ecstasy for a second. Let's look at the clinical, uh, the non-clinical use of the recreational drug ecstasy, which may or may not contain MDMA. We have in the UK 750,000 doses every weekend, okay? Three quarters of a million doses of MDMA are taken every weekend in the UK and have done for the last 25 years, quarter of a century of data. Now, that is a huge amount of use. And it's almost as if we can look at this as a vast epidemiological study in the relative risks and safety of MDMA. Because when we do, we are talking about five deaths a year in the UK that can be attributed to MDMA. And this is a staggeringly low number. So despite, despite the massive use of the recreational drug ecstasy, the actual rates of morbidity and mortality are very low. Now, one thing you can bet is that all five of those cases get onto the front page of the newspaper. So people are left with this impression that MDMA is a, is a dangerous compound. Now, no pharmacology, indeed no medical intervention of any kind, is 100% safe. They all carry risks, from sticking plasters to cancer chemotherapy and open heart surgery. All medical invasion, uh, um, interventions are invasive at some level. But we have to take a very measured evidence-based approach to make a judgment about whether or not clinical MDMA has a place in medicine. And when you look at it with all the risks and the benefits, look together and analyze, I would argue it absolutely does have a place in clinical medicine. Indeed, it's arguably safer than half of the drugs I give patients on a daily basis. So for me, this is not a ethical or controversial subject at all. This is just good science. Indeed, it would be unethical and extremely controversial to not do this. So very rare, low rates of toxicity, morbidity and mortality associated with psychedelics, especially when they're used clinically. Okay, a little brief mention of where we are in terms of medicine today and psychedelics. So if we look at the history, uh, going way back into prehistory, the idea of shamanism and uh, the archaic use of psychedelic drugs in which the shaman would be both the priest and the physician and the psychiatrist and the village elder, and that the use of psychedelic drugs in this communal setting is extremely powerful and healing for the community. We then have an interest in the West with psychedelics at the end of the 19th century, mainly with uh, drugs mescaline, which was synthesized around that time from the peyote cactus, and then synthesized synthetically entirely. And also nitrous oxide was being explored in this, in this era. We then have what we call the second psychedelic era, which most people consider to be the psychedelic era. This is started work with Albert Hoffman's discovery of LSD in the 40s and went on through the 50s and into the 60s. Um, and then, of course, in the 60s, we had this vast explosion of recreational use of psychedelics, which managed to pretty effectively cut dead psychedelic research at that point. And so we then go into this period of the dark ages in the 70s up to the 90s, in which um, psychedelic drugs were extremely demonized and banned. And of course, by demonizing and banning these drugs legally, you very effectively stop the doctors from using them because uh, um, scientists and people in professions there don't want to break the law. 
Of course, you do nothing to stop the recreational use. Indeed, all of the recreational use has increased with all of these drugs since they were prohibited. Um, and this was the same for LSD in the 60s. And then the same happened with MDMA when it was prohibited in the mid 80s um, and then spawned the um, 80s uh, rave scene at the end of the 80s there. But then since the 1990s, we've entered this third psychedelic era, what a lot of people are calling the psychedelic renaissance. And that's where we are at the moment. And it's extremely exciting to be in this place at the moment because a lot of people think that the 60s is the psychedelic era. But in fact, you look at the work that's being done now, we are now eclipsing the 60s. We are doing more work than we did back then. We have more institutions studying these drugs. Obviously, from a cultural point of view, we have more people using these drugs than ever before, um, recreationally. So we talk about the psychedelic 60s, um, we're wrong. This is the psychedelic era now. You people watching this are living in the psychedelic era, much more so than any of our forefathers and foremothers did in the 60s. And uh, there's a shameless plug for my book, The Psychedelic Renaissance, thought I'd get that in there. If you're interested in um, just seeing some of the, um, learning about the studies that are going on now, um, the history of psychedelics within medicine and culture, the, the way the drugs work, how the, what their risks and benefits are, also really a very up-to-date snapshot of the contemporary research that's going on around the world. Um, I've, I've attempted to cover all this in my book, and it's a second edition that came out just last summer. Um, so it's pretty up to date in terms of the shakers and movers within the psychedelic community. So we've got heaps of research that have been done in this psychedelic renaissance. As I've said, most of the work with PTSD has been focusing around, P um, uh, most of the work with MDMA has been focusing around PTSD, apart from that social anxiety and autism study by uh, Alicia. A lot of work with psilocybin, particularly around anxiety and cancer, but also around addictions. We've had LSD therapy for anxiety associated with cancer. And we have a lot of work with drugs such as ibogaine and ayahuasca and ketamine looking at addictions as well. So we're really moving forward. And these are just the clinical studies. We've also done some very exciting studies at Imperial around neurophysiology um, and how the brain works using psychedelics as tools. There's a picture of me um, overseeing the kilogram of MDMA that we've had manufactured through MAPS um, for um, the studies that we're doing and indeed all of the phase three studies coming up. Um, but some really fascinating pieces of work going on around the world here from some of these people and some really interesting conferences alongside that. Um, I'm very privileged to have taken part in all of these studies, either as a study doctor or um, um, administering the medications or receiving the medications as a healthy subject. So in the last 10 years, I have been injected with intravenous psilocybin, DMT, LSD, ketamine, and have taken MDMA as well as part of the research. Um, and uh, I'm quite happy to do this because I have such faith in the, in the drugs themselves and the low toxicity of the drugs, and also the teams around us that have been doing this work. So some really exciting work around neurophysiology and creativity um, using state-of-the-art neuroimaging, um, as well as we're now moving more into clinical studies. When I started working with these substances 10, 15 years ago, I remember when I was, I was a trainee in Oxford at the time, and I remember my tutor taking me aside and saying, Ben, this is career suicide. Are you crazy? Why do you want to work with this bunch of crazy hippies? You're going to destroy your career. Why don't you study something nice and wholesome like SSRIs or antipsychotics? That's where, the, that's where your career should go. Now, he could not have been more wrong because since doing this work, I have found myself part of this fascinating group of people working all over the world at the cutting edge of medicine and neuroscience. So um, I found myself doing wonderful talks like this, dozens of peer-reviewed um, articles in, in high-impact medical journals, lots of media work, books, traveling around the world, giving these presentations. So he could not have been more wrong. It's been the most wonderful career progression for me. And if any of you young people out there are in this same situation where you're concerned that your, your tutor says to you, this is career suicide, what you need to say to him or her is, 
read your journals because not a month goes by that we don't have psychedelics represented in mainstream medical journals and scientific journals. And all of these institutions, Oxford, Cambridge, UCL, Harvard, Maudsley, the Hefter Research Institute, Matt, Johns Hopkins, Yale, Cardiff University, Bristol University, these are not fringe organizations. This is not just a bunch of crazy people in California that are talking about this. This is cutting edge neuroscience. So that's what you say to your tutor. You say, you, if you have these outdated opinions about psychedelic research, you are not at the cutting edge of where this is happening. It's not a fringe subject. It's a very happening subject. And this is why we do this work, because we need to be empathic, we need to be compassionate, but above all, we need to have a scientific understanding as to why people move from childhood pain into adulthood pain and antisocial behaviors, including addictions. And this is why we do it for this little girl. Thank you.